You're now listening to the Rogue Ones podcast, the Rogue Rabbit Trail series. Each time I talk with a guest, sometimes we get a little off topic, which is normal, but these series bring some of those cut conversations into one small episode. Today's conversation is with Paul Cardall. The topics we cover in this smaller Rogue Rabbit Trails episode are kind of all over the map. We talk more about his heart transplant, praying for those after trauma, and the faith legacy his parents set for he and his siblings. But first, we talk about a little television show called Lost. Which is based on a theme from Michael Giacchino that he wrote for a show called Lost. Oh. Oh, Lost. Lost. And I was... It's a little old thing. The, well, the Lost finale actually happened when I was waiting in the hospital to get my heart. So really? one of my things was, Lord, I got to see what happens on Lost. So you can't Were just Were you disappointed? <laughs> what did you, so what did you think? Was it, was it, uh, well, I was like, this is so refreshing that finally on ABC, they would show a finale where people go to heaven. Mm. I was mm. like, what's going on? Wow. <laughs> That's so new. I'm glad you liked it. I loved it. <laughs> Good. It's a strange show, but I loved it because yeah. it's, uh, it, there was a lot of analogies, and and it, it makes me emotional to think about, it, especially now where um, just recently there have been a lot of these videos of people who have donated their organs, and, and they do the walk, or they they're yeah. rolled through the, and everybody from the hospital is standing, and their family is with them. It, I mean, it's it's incredibly powerful and and very important to me, um, and so to think about you walking around with a heart that was not yours initially. I mean, that's... I was listening to a, a new song by Tasha Cobbs. She says that bodies are still being raised. And it's true because um, God gives us endless access to knowledge. Mm. But we have to work for it. Um, I know so many doctors who come up with these brilliant ideas... And then I heard one surgeon say to me, you know, I wish every time they publish their papers on those brilliant ideas, when they go to put their name on it, they put so-and-so, thank you, God. Mm, wow. And so we've come to the point where we're able to um, do take organs out of people's bodies and then replace them with organs from other people. Yeah. And I remember when I was told I needed a heart transplant, it was very challenging because I, I knew that the only way for me to live meant somebody was dying because the heart comes from a person who's donating it. And in most cases, they've, they've died and they don't need it anymore, but that's somebody's son. That's somebody's father. So how do I wrap my mind around this? And my brother... Much younger, we had a prayer uh, with him and my other brothers and my dad. And in the prayer, he said, listen, because of your the donor who's out there somewhere, because of his willingness to sign up to be an organ donor and that donation, you're going to live a little longer. But ultimately, because of Jesus Christ, the greatest organ donor of all, We'll live forever because hmm. hmm. he will raise us all. We're literally raising people from the dead by temporarily with the knowledge we've been able to tap into that God's allowed us to have. Yeah, right. So I can't, There, if there's one thing I'm absolutely confident about is that Jesus was able to raise himself from the dead because we do it all the time now. Hmm. That's that's a no-brainer. That's easy. Mm. Now, now, how it lasts forever? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but I think we're pretty primitive in our knowledge. Were your parents good examples for, oh, yeah. for yeah. you in that way? Yeah. They work hard. They organized. Uh, it's a very patriarchal family, but my mother runs runs the show. Sure. But it's very organized. We had family council. Family council. Well, with 10 people, because you're 10 people in your family, yeah, right? You'd, family you'd council. Have to... We would have every Sunday we'd get together after church and have a meeting. Okay. My mother would go over the calendar. 
My That's dad brilliant. would give out assignments. He used to have a map of what the, the of the the house and the property, and he would subdivide the yard into, okay, that's Paul, that's Karen, that's Carol, that, and that was our assignment that week. You know what this sounds like? Have you read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Well, Stephen Covey is from our neck of the world. Okay. So yes, that's what I he's thought. He's a Utah boy. He's a Utah boy, right. Well, he talks about his son, how he gave his son the job of keeping the grass, whatever, and it took several times of him teaching him and showing him, and then him failing and him coming back. Yeah. And that's what that's reminding me of. Stephen. Yeah, it's, it's Covey. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. the Covey stuff. Too often we get these huge miracles and then we spread ourselves thin. Hmm. Instead of really taking a step back and going, what just happened? Why did God take it that way? Hmm. What am I supposed to learn from it? Hmm. And I think you need to get some therapy on those big events in your life. Even miracles, as you're saying. Not even yeah. just tragedy, but... but well, there's the phrase, faith precedes the miracle, you know, mm. this kind, this kind comes not out save by fasting and by prayer. So you perform these miraculous miracles, but then afterwards, how many people are actually sitting there and reflecting on what happened? Mm-hmm. We're too busy saying, Jesus, feed us again. Oh, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. where's, where's the food? You mm-hmm. brought food last time. Where's the food? And then we wow. bail on him. Wow. Because you experienced trauma with your miracle. It wasn't all just... My brother died. Why is my friend denied a transplant? Because I didn't have insurance. Oh. Why this? Why that? So, you you know, and then you everybody thinks you're Lazarus. Mm. Now, first thing I do when I die, I'm going to go straight to Lazarus. I'm going to say, hey, buddy, how many times did you have to testify? How many te- times did you give your testimony? Are you just burned out or what? But but I think there's this there's a strange thing that I learned... I figured it out, and, and it's a theory I have. And, I, and um, when, when we lose somebody or when we go through something really hard and people know, they start praying. And all of a sudden, we start to feel some strength. We feel like, oh, people care, okay? So, you know, there's a funeral. Everybody's praying. You're able to get through it. But then the funeral's over or... You just got your transplant miracle or whatever. You're, everyone's now stopped praying. Mm. And so there's this energy that leaves you. Mm. And you're like, people aren't thinking about me anymore. People on this. Well, what it is, it's the fact that prayer works. <laughs> prayer works. So when you are asking people to pray and you recruit prayer, you're, all this energy is coming out of you in love this love that's reaching through something uh, that God is doing and he's channeling all that love from each of us for each other and then it's gone Mm. because Mm. now we're focused on the next person or what we need to do and so with like funerals I always say you need to keep praying for at least six months after Yeah, you know or until you know they've come out somewhat uh, still functioning Mm -hmm. because you lose somebody, it's like amputation. Paul is a man of deep faith and deep convictions, and our entire conversation was very much like what you just heard. If you haven't listened to the whole episode, you can see all episodes past and present at rogueonespodcast.com or at any platform where you find your podcasts. Thanks for listening today, friend. We'll talk again soon.